Welcome to this breakaway session entitled The Power Behind Corel Draw. My name is Roger Wombolt, and I'm Senior Product Trainer at Corel. During this session, we'll be discovering some of the powerful tools and features that are available in Corel Draw 2021. So without further ado, let's get started. In Corel Draw Graphics Suite 2021, it includes Corel Draw, which is vector illustration and page layout. CorelDraw.app is an online graphic design uh, interface via the web. Corel Photo Paint 2021 is for raster manipulation or editing bitmaps. We have Corel Power Trace, which is part of CorelDraw itself, and it allows you to convert bitmaps to vector objects. Corel Capture 2021 is a screen capture utility, and I should point out that it's only available for Windows. And then finally, we have the Corel Font Manager with uh, giving you the ability to do font exploration, and it's a management tool, allows you to create collections and that sort of thing. Now, let's take a look at the interface. From the top, we have a standard drop-down menu across the top where you find most of the commands. Below that is a standard toolbar or button bar, and it includes some of the more common features such as new document, open, print, import, export, and that sort of thing. Below that is the interactive property bar, also called the context sensitive property bar, as it changes depending on the tool that you select within the toolbox, and it gives you more functionality to these tools. Speaking of the toolbox, down the left-hand side are your tools. Any tool that has a little triangle in the bottom right-hand corner, that's an indication that there's additional tools underneath that. Looking down at the bottom left-hand corner, and let me just do an undo on that. Bottom left-hand corner, we have page navigation. This allows me to go back a page, I can go forward a page, I can go to the end of the document, or I can click on specific page tabs go to, to go to that specific page. Below that is a status bar, and the status bar will give me an indication as to what I have selected and give me information about that item. On the right-hand side of the status bar, we show the fill and outline. So if I had an object selected that has a fill and an outline, I'll be able to see that there. Looking at the right-hand side, we have our standard color palette. This is the color palette that is set up based on the co color mode of the document itself. So this one, for example, if I do a mouse over one of the colors, I can see that this is actually an RGB color palette. To the left of that, we have dockers. Now, dockers give additional functionality. and There's additional tools in the dockers. Dockers are accessible from the Windows menu down to dockers and you can see them all listed here. Another way to access those is by clicking on this icon here and it will show me a list of all the dockers and I can just turn on and off the ones that I want. All right, let's move on to my next page. Next we have the welcome book. Now the welcome book is located this tab right here. If this by chance isn't opened up, you can go to your help menu down to welcome screen. And in here, we have the Get Started. Now, Get Started allows you to start with a new document. You can uh, continue editing one you've previously edited or recently edited. This is what I refer to as Give It a Try. And so in here, you can actually uh, click on these icons. They'll launch an application or they'll launch a, uh, a document and give you some steps on how to use some of the things within it. Below that, we have Open Document. So if it's not a recently edited document, you'll be able to come down here and open that document. You also have New from Template. Next, we have Workspaces. Within the Workspaces tab, there's a number of different workspaces. We have the Light Workspace, Default, Touch Workspace for those that are on the road and maybe using a tablet or something like that. And then we have some specialty workspaces, Illustration, Page Layout, and Adobe Illustrator. Now, the Adobe Illustrator workspace is designed to make it easier for those who use Adobe Illustrator and want to migrate over to Corel Draw. So we've put the tools in a familiar spot for you, make it easier to use. We have the learning, where you have different tutorials in here and access to different content. We also have in here our Discovery Center, uh, and you can access that from learn.corel.com. And finally, the store. And the store is where you're going to be able to access uh, 
purchases that you want to make for software. We have applications, there's plugins, uh, maybe you want to purchase fonts and that sort of thing. You'll also notice that I have something called free and this is where you get the free content that comes within Corel Draw. So things such as the fonts, uh, various textures fills, bitmap fills, as well as the clip art. To access any of this content, it's simply a matter of clicking on the pack that you want and simply click on download. It's as simple as that. Okay, let's go back to our next slide. Now, let's take a look at the new document dialog box. So from the file menu, I'm going to select new. In the new document dialog box, we have a spot for the name. The name is what's going to appear in your title bar at the top. There are a number of presets. I can dictate how many pages I want this new document to be. I can also select either page view uh, as a single page or multi-page. And this is new for CorelDRAW 2021. Here's my primary color mode, and this will dictate what color palette is appearing on the right-hand side. And under dimensions, there is a number of preset page sizes that I can have access to. I also have the ability to create a custom page size and then my rendering resolution. Now, just a little point about the rendering resolution. What that is, is the resolution at which uh, lenses and transparencies get rendered out as. And so if you're doing a large format print, let's say you're doing a banner that is maybe uh, 48 inches long, and you have a piece of text on that with a drop shadow, that drop shadow is going to get rendered out at uh, 300 dpi. Something like that, I would probably recommend bringing that down to 96 dpi. You're not going to lose any quality, and what it will do is it will speed up the rip time for you and decrease the file size when you're saving this file out. I'm going to hit cancel on this, and we'll move to the next slide. Now, one of the other features that we've added in 2021 is the auto fit. I love this feature. I'm going to uh, deselect the uh, everything on the page. You'll notice my interactive property bar shows my page information here. This icon is referred to as auto fit. So what I'm going to do is I'll click on the auto fit icon and here I can set up a margin. Now I'm going to set up a margin of an eighth of an inch. Rather than trying to figure out what the decimal point is for that, I'm just going to go one divided by eight and then I'll select auto fit. Now, it created a page, it auto fit the page. It did not take this into consideration simply because this is on what we refer to as a master layer. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. So it's a great way to take an object or take a design and shrink the page or stretch the page to fit the actual content on screen. Now let's take a look at the Pages Docker. The Pages Docker gives you the ability to easily edit multi-page documents. From the Windows menu, I'm going to go down to Dockers and I'll select Pages. Now, within the Pages Docker, I have the ability to do a single page view. I can do a multi-page view. And with the multi-page view, I'll just zoom out a bit and you can see that I have my multiple pages set up here for this particular uh, video. Within the multi-page, within the multi-page view, I have the ability to dictate the layout, whether I want it as tiled, I want vertical, horizontal, or maybe I want to do a custom layout of the pages themselves. I can also dictate how many columns and the spacing between columns. So if I was to drop this down by one, then this is going to refresh itself and it will give me seven columns across. Now, another nice thing about it is that I can select any of the pages within the Docker itself. That then becomes the active page. You'll notice the active page, the page number is uh, in blue. One other really nice feature about dealing with the Pages Docker is if I had an object on the page and I want to move it to a different page, then I simply need to click and drag and that object will now be on this next page. So it makes it very easy to edit across pages. I also have the ability to uh, sort the pages or reorder them. So in the Docker, I can select a page, click and drag, and move it to a different location, and uh, thereby reordering my pages. Now, let's take a look at File I.O. With File I.O. or File Input Output, uh, we talk about importing and exporting. So I'm going to import an image. 
I'll click on my import icon. Alternatively, I could have done a control I or file import. And I'm going to bring in this image here. One thing I want to point out here is bottom right hand corner on the import icon, I have a drop down. Here I have the ability to import this. I can import it as externally linked. I can import as high res for output, provided I'm using an OPI server. In this case, I am not, and that's why it's grayed out. I also have the ability to resample and load or crop and load. If I selected crop and load, for example, it's going to allow me to crop this image. And then I'll simply cl click OK and it will bring this image in. Now here I can simply left click my mouse button, which will drop it in place at full size. I can hit enter. It'll center it on the page or spacebar for original position. I can also click and drag and dictate what size I want this to come in at. And so there's my, my image importing. Now, one other new feature that we've added to CorelDRAW 2021 is the multi-export. To access the multi-export from the Windows menu, I'm going to go down to Dockers and I'll select Export. In the Export Docker, I can select an image and then click on this icon here, which will add that to my export list. Here we can see it's picked up the name based on the name that I've given this in the Object Manager. And here I can see that I have the ability to change this from JPEG to GIF to PNG or PDF. I'm going to select PNG for this. Under the settings, I have the ability to set the settings for the PNG. And of course, there's different formats of PNG or different uh, flavors of PNG in here. Under the transform, I can set my resolution. So if I wanted to use this on a web page, something like that, I might want to drop this down to 96 DPI and I can click OK. Now, here I have the ability to duplicate this. And what that will allow me to do is it will put another copy of the Alamo here and I'm going to change this and I want this as a GIF image. I'll leave the settings as default. I also have the ability to add an asset with these settings. So if I selected this image here and I clicked on, I'm going to go with PNG, add asset with these settings, it's going to add the Greek ruins to this with the same settings as the PNG for the Alamo. So if I had multiple objects selected, I can select these objects. I can come down here and I can add these objects to my export list as well. And now it's simply a matter of clicking on export all. And what this will do is it will export these files out to a folder that I've already set up in here. Now that I have the images exported, I can open up the folder where I've sent them to and we can see that I have my images in here. So I have the JPEG, the PNG, and then these other PNGs as well. All right, let me close this Docker off and we'll go on to the next page. So new from template or templates, as I mentioned, very easy to create new documents based on a template. It's simply a matter of going to the file menu and selecting new from template. And what this is going to do is it's going to open up a template dialog box. In here, we can see that I have my templates. Uh, I can also select all templates. And uh, with all templates selected, we'll be able to see the templates that are provided with the software. And this allows me, as I say, to get a head start on creating a design. So I can scroll through here. I can select a specific template. If I want to see these thumbnails larger, then I can certainly do that, just sliding this open a bit. And then it's simply a matter of clicking on the open and uh, start to work with that template. Now I mentioned the uh, object docker. Object docker is a docker that parks on the right hand side, as most dockers do. And in here, I can see elements that are within the document. Here we can see I have a number of pages. If I wanted to, I can select this icon and that's only going to show me the elements that are on this one particular page. I can change pages up here as well. And one thing you'll notice, if you're a user of older versions of CorelDRAW, we enhanced this quite a bit in CorelDRAW 2019, where we now have a visual representation of the objects that are on screen. So for example, if I select this flower, you can actually see it in the object docker. 
Also in here I have the ability to turn that visually off or I can lock it and do a number of other things within the objects docker. Okay, selecting and aligning objects. So selecting of course is done with the pick tool. I can single click on an element and that will select that. I'll do a control Z to undo that. If I left click and drag, it's what we refer to as a marquee select. So I'm going to marquee select this area and you can see that I can actually take this and pull this aside. Now, if we have objects grouped together, I don't need to do a marquee select. It's simply a matter of single clicking and moving that element. If we take a look at grouping, for those that are relatively new to Corel Draw and that term, grouping, if you visualize taking a bundle of pencils and putting an elastic band around it, you still have your individual objects, but they're tied together with something. So grouping basically allows you to tie objects together. All right, let's take a look at another way of selecting elements. I'll select this ellipse, and if I use the tab key, it will cycle through objects in the order they are created. So I'm going to select the cyan, a tab, I'll select my green, tab, yellow, and I'm just hitting the tab key, each one here is magenta, and then finally I'll go with purple. Now aligning objects is very easy as well. So with this object selected, I'm going to hold my shift key down and I'll start selecting these objects. I'm going to select the red object last. And now I've selected the red object, I want to align these. So I can align the top with T, B for bottom, L for left, R for right, C for center, and E for even. So very easy to align objects. So if I had something like this over here, I would marquee select these elements and then tap the letter L for left alignment and it would do that for me. Now two more things I want to show you about selecting elements. First, I'm going to take this uh, cyan ellipse. I'll make it larger. In fact, I'm going to make it cover the entire image. I'm holding the shift key down and that's going to resize from the center out. Now, I want you to watch in my object docker over here. If I hold the Alt key down and I click right here, it has selected the green element. If I click again, I have my yellow, my red, my magenta, and, f and then finally the purple element. So selecting with the Alt key down, we refer to that as a digger key. And it allows you to dig down one level at a time each time you click. An advantage or a situation where you might use that is you've got a bitmap on screen with a lens over top of it. Maybe there's some text on top of the bitmap and then the lens and you want to edit the text without having to move the lens, you can simply use the Alt key. Now another keyboard shortcut that helps with selecting is the Control key. So I'm going to take this element, I'm going to do a Shift F2 to zoom into it. Now with the Control key held down, I'm going to start clicking on some of these elements within here. You'll note that my sizing handles are round dots. So I'll click here and I'll simply, with the shift key held down as well, I'll select some of these elements. And so very easy to select elements within a group using the control key. One more thing you can use the control key for is in the color palette, if I hold the control key down and click on a color, it's going to add 10% of that color each time I click on it. So each time I'm clicking, it's adding 10% more red to that element. I can go and click on a bit of orange and change the color of that. So 10% is added each time I click on a color within the color palette with the control key held down. One more thing about the color palette is if I click and hold on it, you can see that I have an array of colors that I can use. And these are based on HSL or hue, saturation, and lightness. Let me just move out to my uh, full page and let's move on to the next page. So copy versus duplicate. I usually recommend that users do duplicate rather than copy. Uh, when we do a copy of an element, I want you to watch my cursor. I'm going to do a control C to copy. And you'll notice that my cursor turned to a little blue circle, spinning circle. It's actually called a throbber. But what was happening there is it was taking the content from that image and copying it to the Windows clipboard. To do that, it creates a temporary file. Watch my cursor once again when I do a control V to paste that back in. Again, I got that circle back, it was reading from the temp file, and it was dropping it into my document for me. Now, the problem with that is that we end up building up a lot of temp files on the system. There's other processes that will build temp files as well, such as printing and importing and exporting. But temp files, excessive temp files, can really bog down the system. If I was to draw an analogy, it's like hair in a drain. It just plugs it right up. 
Now, usually what I recommend is Control D, and that will duplicate the element. If I select this, hold the Control key down to constrain it, move that over, I'll do another Control D, and you can see it's duplicating and it's remembering the distance that I used. Let me show you one other thing. I'm going to marquee select these and delete them. We'll do this once again. So I'll do a Control D, and you'll notice on the interactive property bar, this is an inch wide by one and a quarter high. This is the position based on the zero, zero coordinates of my rulers. Now, if I want to change the zero, zero coordinates of the rulers, let's say I do laser engraving and I want my zero, zero to be top left, simply clicking in the intersection up here, drag this out, I've now reset my rulers to zero, zero being top left. So I'm going to select this element and you can see I've duplicated that. Let me just do a control Z. I'll duplicate that again. And now in here, I'm going to click plus one inch because that's the width of it, plus uh, three sixteenths, three divided by 16 and hit enter. So that has now created a copy of that three sixteenths of an inch apart. And if I keep hitting the control D, it will create an array for me. I'll marquee select these, control D, and it's 1.25. So in here, I want to go minus 1.25, minus, and I can mix and match units of measure. So here, I want to go one millimeter, and I'll hit enter. So these are a millimeter apart, and control D, and it will remember that. So if you want to do, for example, you're doing a uh, nameplates, engraving some nameplates, and your nameplates are uh, three quarters of an inch by two inches, or inch and a quarter by three and a half inches, whatever they might be. You can create those rectangles, duplicate them into an array, cut that out to make your jig, and then simply put that in the engraver, create your document, and you're ready to go. So it's a great time saver. All right, I'll talk a little bit about shaping. Now, Shaping in Corel Draw is done, of course, with the shape tool. Uh, there's also a number of different uh, shaping commands. So if I select this rectangle, you'll notice on my interactive property bar at the top, there's some, some things I can do with this. I can change the type of corner rounding on this. So for example, if I grab my shape tool now, I can change this to a chamfer. Let's go back to the rounded corner. And now, if I hold the shift key down and select the yellow object as well, I have two objects selected now. My interactive property bar has changed. Here, I can do a combine, and a combine will create a knockout where the objects overlap. I'm just going to do a Control-Z to undo that. I'll do another Control-Z. I'll select the yellow object first, hold the shift key down, select my blue element, and then hit combine, and you'll notice that they've changed blue. So shaping commands are based on the last object selected. Let me do a control Z for this. And now with the shift key held down, I'll click weld. And think of machine shop, metal shop, welding two pieces of metal together, they become one, and that's basically what we've done here. I'm gonna do a control Z. And the final one I want to show is simplify. So selecting these elements, I'll click on simplify, and that acts as a cookie cutter, and it cuts down below. So I can move this out element out of the way, and you can see that it has cut out of the red. It's also cut out of the yellow. I'll select my yellow. I can move that aside, and that's actually cut out of the red. Let's just go ahead and I'm going to move this back here. Now, one more thing with respects to shaping and freehand drawing and that sort of thing, dealing with curves. I'm going to grab my freehand tool, and if I do a single click, and move my cursor someplace else, it will allow me to create a straight line. If I hold the control key down, it will constrain that on 15 degree increments. Of course, I can change that in tools options. But for now, I just wanna point out that if I left click now, it will lock it in place. You'll note that my cursor is a downward pointing arrow. If I left click now, it's actually going to join to that element. I'll click over here, a second click, and then I can click up here, and that will end that off. I've now created a solid shape that I can then give a fill. I'm going to tap my space bar. Now, the space bar, here's another a little tool tip. The space bar will actually toggle back and forth between your pick tool 
and the last tool selected. So if I have the rectangle selected and I draw a rectangle, I tap my space bar, it goes back to the pick tool that allows me to move elements around or select other elements. Okay, I'm going to show you some other stuff with the freehand tool. So I'll click on my freehand tool, I'll left click, drag down here, I'm going to double click, I'll double click over here in this spot up here as well and then finally I want to move it to I get that pointed arrow and I'll single click. Now if I grab my shape tool and I marquee select this on the interactive property bar I can convert these lines to curves and now with the shape tool I can come over here I'll zoom in a little bit and I can actually move these curves into position. And this is a, typically how you would recreate a logo or re redraw a logo by, by grabbing these elements and move them into position. Now I'm just, I'm just doing this very quickly to give you an idea. Now I'm going to tap my space bar. I'll come back over here and I'm going to grab my freehand tool again. And again, I'm just going to do this very quickly. Close that off. Grab my shape tool and marquee select this, convert to a curve, and then I will move these into position. Tap the space bar. I'm going to do a control D to duplicate that, and I'll just move this down here. It's not accurate, but you get an idea. Now, if I marquee select this, I'm going to give them all a color, and if you remember, combine creates a knockout where objects overlap. I've now combined that, and we now have created this shape again. Let's do an F4 to zoom out to my page, and I'm going to move on to my next page. Um, I'm moving back and forth on pages, and I'm using number one and number two on the keyboard. I'll explain why later on when we get to the end of this uh, session, and I'll uh, show you some other ways in which you can save a lot of time in design work. Okay, I'm going to show the crop tool now. So in my toolbox, I have a couple of different tools here. I'm going to grab the crop tool. I'll left click and drag and I will double click. That's going to crop this out, but you've noticed that it's gotten rid of the entire design. This is actually a, a common call that we used to get on the support line. The reason it did this is because I did not have anything selected. So let me just do a control Z to undo. I'll tap my space bar. I'll marquee select this element, tap my space bar again, gives me back my crop tool, and now when I crop, I can double click and it will crop out from what I have selected. And this is typically the way you would want to do it. Now, the next tool I want to show is the knife tool. And with the knife tool, I'm going to tap my space bar, marquee select this, get my knife tool back. And you'll notice on the knife tool setting on the property bar, I have the ability to do a uh, two-point line. I can do a free line. I can do Bezier, a number of things here. I also have the ability to set an overlap or a gap. Now, if I'm doing a, uh, a vinyl for windows and I want to span a couple of window panes, then maybe I want to do a gap to allow for the aluminum uprights in there. Uh, if I'm doing embroidery and I want to create a split front, then I'll want to go with an overlap. I'm going to set my overlap for this design at quarter inch, and then it's simply a matter of left clicking and dragging. Hold the control key down to uh, keep that constrained. When I let the mouse button go, you can see it's actually cropped it for me. Now, if I marquee select this area here, I'm going to move this straight down. You can see that I've created a, a bit of it. Let me move that down a little bit more. You see that I've actually created an overlinch, uh, a one-eighth overlap for this. Let me just move that back into place temporarily. All right, so the next thing I want to show is the virtual segment delete tool. We used to have to take a circle. If I wanted to cut a piece out of this circle, I would have to convert the circle to curves. I'd have to add nodes, break the nodes apart, break the entire thing apart, and then delete that element. With the virtual segment delete tool, it's made it much, much easier. I can draw a line across here. I'm going to grab my virtual segment delete tool and then simply click on this line here, and that will delete that. And then, of course, I can select this line and delete it. And so I've cut the top off. Now, with the virtual segment delete tool, I can go through this design and delete whatever lines I want um, that uh, 
to make my design. Also, if I hold the Alt key down, I can left click and drag, and whatever this marquee touches will be deleted when I release the mouse button. All right, I'm going to show you some of the interactive tools within CorelDRAW. Now, I'm going to right click, and I just want to make sure that I have lock toolbars deselected. That then will allow me to click and hold, and I can grab the gripper bar at the top and pull this toolbar right out. So this gives me the ability to bring the tools out at hand. And this is just a start to customize the interface. So if I use these tool, tools a lot, and I don't want to have to go digging through, then I can bring them out on screen. Uh, the first one I want to show is a blend, and it's simply left click and drag, and so I'm blending from one object to the next. When we create something like a blend or a drop shadow, uh, even an, an extrude, there's something referred to as a control object. I'm going to tap my space bar, I'll deselect, and now if I select this uh, magenta element, you can see that I have in the status bar a control ellipse selected. If I change the color of this control ellipse, it will change the way the blend appears. There's, so with the blend, there's two control objects. The other one is at the back, and I'm going to change that. I also have the ability with the blend to change the number of steps. It's going to make it a lot smoother. There's a number of features up here where I can change the, the rate at which it blends and that sort of thing. Uh, next, we have the contour tool. So with the contour tool and the object selected, I can set the number of contours to the outside or to the inside. I can also dictate the width of that. So if I'm creating an applique, I may want two steps to the outside. I can then take these elements and from the uh, uh, objects menu, I can, I can break that apart. Tap my space bar and I now have these separate elements that I can use. I'll need to ungroup that. And so these are my three separate elements that I can use. If I'm using Tackle Twill or something like that, I can simply send these to the engraver and cut them out or whatever method you use for cutting your twill. All right, <clears throat> next one is the envelope tool. So with the piece of text selected, I'll click on the envelope tool. I'm gonna zoom into this a little bit. You'll notice that I have nodes here. If I click and drag this node, you can see it's not a very smooth curve. I'm going to do a control Z. If I double click the node, it'll remove it. If I double click anywhere on the line, it will add a node for me. And so I can move from there if I wanted to. If you want a nice smooth curve, delete that node and simply move my line straight up. Let me do a control Z, delete this node as well. It sort of got in the way and I can move this straight up so I have a nice smooth curve here. I'm going to show you another little uh, tool tip is if I hold my roller ball on my mouse down, it's going to change the pan tool and I can pan around my document. Now, I could use the letter H uh, for pan. The drawback with using that is I then have to go back over to my toolbar to select a different tool in order to uh, get it away from the pan tool. So the roller ball on your mouse is very easy to zoom around. One other thing you can do is tap the letter N on your keyboard. I refer to this as a nano preview. And what that's going to do is it's going to show me my entire page. And so I can move to a different area. When I'm in the area that I want, I'll simply left click my mouse button. I also have that capability down the bottom right hand corner. Clicking here will do the same thing for me. I prefer the letter N, it's a lot easier. So let's take a look at uh, extrude. I'm going to select this element and then I'll click on extrude. And this now allows me to pull this back and I can change my vanishing point to wherever I want to. Zoom in a little bit. And in the interactive property bar at the top, there's a number of different features. So for example, if I wanted to, I could add color to this. And within the color, I can change whatever color I want. Maybe I want that to go from red to, uh, to green. Uh, then I can certainly do that. I'm going to do an F4 to zoom back out. And the next is drop shadow. Now, in 2020, we added a new drop shadow called the uh, inside drop shadow. And so we've changed the drop shadow here. Uh, this used to be the regular drop shadow. Now, if I select that, I have to come up to the interactive property bar for my regular drop shadow. And I will click and drag. 
and that allows me to create a drop shadow. Uh, I can set this drop shadow any position I want to. If I was to do it from the edge of the document or from the bottom, let's say from the bottom, creating a drop shadow allows me to change the angle of that, the perspective, and it now makes it look as though the light is coming from above and behind. I'm going to undo that and let's just do your regular drop shadow. With the drop shadow, one of the things you can do is I can come up here on the interactive property bar and I can change the color of that drop shadow. I could also grab a color from the color palette and drag and drop into this square. Now the next drop shadow I want to show is the inside drop shadow. And this is a new one we added in 2020. With this one, I simply click and drag and that will create a shadow for me. So this is an inside drop shadow, and it's now made it look as though this is a cutout. Depending on where this is, will determine how that's going to look. I want just a little bit on there, and uh, so that's a, a pretty cool effect. And the final shadow is the block shadow. Now the block shadow is part of the effects toolbar. So with this object selected, I'm going to hold my rollerball down, just pan up a little bit. I'm going to select my block shadow tool. I'll click and drag, and I'll just move that off a little bit. On the interactive property bar, I can do a number of things, such as uh, changing the offset, changing the angle of it. I can change color. I have the ability to simplify. Uh, simplify is actually uh, kind of interesting. I can remove holes and whatnot. I'm just going to simplify that. And now from the Objects menu, I'm going down to Break uh, Block Shadow Apart. I'll tap my space bar to give me my Pick Tool, and then I'll just move this out of the way. So we've created an interesting effect right here with our Block Shadow Tool. Let's move that back onto the page. I'll do an F4 to uh, zoom to the entire page, and let's move on to my next page. Uh, we talked a little bit about enveloping, a uh, very quick way to create a virtual sample, simply a matter of clicking and dragging, and there we have it. Uh, actually, this doesn't really look like a very good virtual sample. We can easily dress this up a bit. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. I'll position this. I'm going to grab my envelope tool, and now I'm going to double-click this node to remove it and I want to bring this down, and I'm going to try and match the curvature of the top of the mug. And here, I want to match the curvature of the bottom of the mug. And so now, that looks a little bit more realistic for a virtual sample. I can use my cursor keys to nudge this up a little bit, and uh, now I can send this off to the customer and uh, potentially get the order. Uh, transparencies and lenses. So they're fairly similar. Uh, with lenses, there's a number of different uh, things you can do. I'm going to grab this magnifying glass, and I actually have a magnifying lens that I've uh, grouped into this lens itself. So when I click and drag and I bring this over my image, you can see it's magnified in there. I'm going to open up my lens docker from the Windows menu, down to Dockers, down to Effects, and lenses. So you can see that I have no lens effect and that's because I've selected a group of elements. I want to select just the lens itself. So if you remember, control plus click allows me to select an object within a group. I can now change the type of lens. So if I want a color limit, uh, maybe I want a fisheye lens or something like a heat map lens. So there's a number of different lenses in here that you can play around with and create various effects. Tinted grayscale, transparency, wireframe, uh, bitmap effects, and that sort of thing. Transparencies allow me to take an object, and actually let's go back to the previous page where I have a little more space. I'm going to draw a rectangle. I'll give it a solid color fill, and I'll select my transparency tool. Now here, I can left click and drag and create a transparency. So we fade it out to this position. If I move this up here, I can set the fade on that and actually have it fade away to nothing. If I was to put this over top of an image, you can see that I've got it faded down this way. Let's take a look at that other page in here. We can also do this to bitmaps. So I'm going to select this element. I'll hold the shift key down. I'll select this image here. And if you remember the alignment keys, it's L for left, B for bottom, 
And now with the transparency tool selected, I'll left click and drag and I've basically caused the image above to fade into the one in the back. So I've created an interesting effect. Let's do it one more time with this. I'm going to do a Shift F2 and that will zoom into this element. I'll tap my space bar. I'll left click and drag on a bit of an angle here. And so I've taken this front image and I've created transparency on this half of it. I'm going to tap my space bar to return to the pick tool. I hold my Alt key down. I'll click once more. That has now selected the second bitmap down. I'll tap my space bar and I'll left click and drag with my transparency tool and just bring this up a little bit. And so I've actually created another transparency in here. Move that down a little bit, make it a little bit more realistic. So very easy. I've taken three separate images and created a rather interesting effect with those. If I was to pull these apart, you can see what that would look like. Okay, let's uh, undo these and I'll move on to my next uh, slide. So perspective. Now, just a little side note here. In CorelDRAW 2021, we've added the capability to draw in perspective. I will not be covering that here. You've already seen that in the uh, in the, the previous presentation. But uh, I do want to show you perspective with bitmaps that we've recently added to CorelDRAW. I'm going to Shift F2 to zoom into this. And now by selecting this bitmap, I'm going to position the upper left hand corner in this. And this is relatively new, the ability to uh, add perspective to a bitmap. So from the objects menu, I'll go down to perspective and then select add perspective. Now it's simply a matter of moving the corners of this image onto this billboard itself. And that will make it look as though the image is right on the billboard. Let's move this in. I'll let it go, and that way I can see where I want that to go. So very quick and very easy. I've given the illusion that this image is on the billboard. I'm going to zoom back out. Uh, here it is with text, the same sort of thing. I'll move it on to this easel, and from the Objects menu down to Perspective, and then Add Perspective. And it's simply a matter, as I say, dragging these four corner nodes into the corner areas of the chalkboard or blackboard. And there we go. So we've created a sandwich board that we can stand outside the restaurant. Maybe I'm doing a mock-up of a restaurant and I want to put something like that inside. Then I can certainly do that. All right, let's talk a little bit about text. Now in Corel Draw, there's two types of text. We have artistic text and paragraph text. They're both created using the same tool. So on the left-hand side in the toolbar, I'll simply click on my text tool. And now if I click on my page, I can type artistic text. To create paragraph text, with the text tool selected, it's a left click and drag, and I create a paragraph text frame. Now in this frame, if I was to right click, for example, I can insert placeholder text, and that will give you a visual representation as what this was going to look like. So if I wanted to create a mock-up of a newsletter or something like that, then I can certainly do that. Just to, to draw the differences between artistic text and paragraph text, as an analogy, if you take a look at a box of cereal, the brand of cereal on the front or the, the name of the cereal on the front is going to be artistic text. The contest rules or ingredients on the back is going to be paragraph text. One common question we get is, I want to be able to wrap my text around a circle or around an ellipse, and I want to be able to read it properly. So with the text selected, right click and drag. I'm going to let the mouse button go, and I'll select fit text to path. That's put the text on the path for me. Now, bottom left-hand corner of the, of the piece of text itself, I have a little red glyph. It's kind of hard to see here, but it's there. And as I move my text, you'll see a red beam uh, appear. So the text is starting at the 12 o'clock position. It's centered at 12 o'clock. And I have these red beams at 3, 6, 9, and 12 o'clock positions. And it allows me for easy centering. I'm going to select this piece of text. Now, because this object is no longer an ellipse, it's now considered a compound object, I cannot right-click and drag. So instead, what I'll do is I'll go to my text menu and down to Fit Text to Path, and then I'll point to where the path is. Once I position the text where I want it, I'll let my mouse button go, and then I want to flip this around. So on the interactive property bar, I'm going to mirror horizontally, 
mirror vertically. And now if I want to, I can just grab the glyph here and position that text uh, in place. You'll also notice that there's a little flag there that says it's 0.375 inches. That's a great way to ensure that this piece of text is the same distance as that one. All right, one more thing on, on text is uh, variable font support, and that's relatively new in CorelDRAW as well. So with variable fonts, you have the ability of changing certain parameters of that font. With the font selected, and let me just move my uh, page over to this side. With the font selected, I'll click on this icon. It's a drop down with all the different properties that I can change for this piece of text. Now, this particular font has quite a large number of uh, variables that I can uh, modify. Most pieces of variable text that I've seen or most fonts that I've seen will typically have one, two, three, or four options that you can play around with. So for example, I can change inline. I can bring that up a bit. And you can see we now have a little bit of a um, an outline type font. Maybe you want to change the weight of it as well. So I can bring that up. There's a number of different uh, options for this particular font that I can do. As you can see, very easy to, uh, to modify the text. Let me just uh, bring this back centered on the page. And if I type another piece of text, and we'll type a piece of text, let's call it uh, breakaway. I'll select this with my pick tool selected. Select this piece of text, right click and drag, let the mouse button go and copy all properties. So I've now included those properties or added these properties to this piece of text. And it makes it a lot easier than me having to go back in here and figure out exactly what settings I had. Okay, let me just bring up Corel Font Manager. And in Corel Font Manager, you'll notice that I have libraries on the left-hand side. I have a number of filters here. On my toolbar across the top, I have the ability to create what we call a watched folder. Now, a watched folder is a folder that's located on your hard drive, and any font that you put in there, the font manager will pick up on, and we can make use of that. You no longer have to have the font installed in order to be able to use it. And in fact, if you look on the right-hand side, Fonts that have the green bar are fonts that are installed. Those that have the yellow bar, they're not installed. We can also see that these are open type fonts. This is a true type font. And I can scroll through here and uh, see all the fonts that I've got. And actually, if you look at the bottom left hand corner, you can see I have over 8,000 fonts uh, on this system. They're not installed. They're not all installed into Windows, and therefore it's not going to be slowing my system down. Further on the right hand side, if I was to select a font over here, I'm going to be able to see the glyphs that are within that font. I can also filter those glyphs. So I want to see what currency uh, glyphs are in that particular font or mathematical symbols and that sort of thing. Now, for me to install a font, if I scroll down to a font that's not installed, I'll select a font, right click, and it's simply a matter of clicking on install. If I have a font that's already installed and I want to remove it, then uh, it's simply a matter of right clicking and uninstalling. With respect to the collections, if I pull this down a bit, you can see I have a number of different collections in here. So here are my chalk fonts. I have grunge fonts, uh, poster. These are collections that I've created. To create a collection, it's simply a matter of clicking on this icon, and that will allow me to create a new collection, and I can give that whatever name I want. And then it's simply a matter of going to my fonts. I can right-click on a font, and I can add to collection, and then in here, I'll just dictate what collection I want to put that in. And now if I was to go to that collection, I can see that I have that font in there. How does this work with CorelDRAW? Let me just minimize this. I'm back in CorelDRAW. I'll select this piece of text up here. I'll go to my fonts drop down. And in here, you can see I have filters actually turned on right now. Just click the funnel, it'll turn your filters on. I'll deselect this filter. Actually, I can clear all filters that are currently selected. And I can go through looking for specific filters. Maybe I want to go into my grunge folder. 
uh, that I've created. I can click on this and uh, that will select all the grunge fonts and it will allow me to pick from those uh, instead of having to scroll through a great big massive list of fonts. All right, let's move on. Now, clip art is very easy to access. So to access my clip art, I'll go into the Connect Content Docker. I already have that open, so I'll click on that. And in here, you can see we have a have the clip art. Up here, I have the ability to search. So I'll just type in horse. And very quick, it's found a number of images that have horse as a keyword. To use that, of course, simply click and drag, and I can bring that in on the screen and then make use of that, uh, of that image. If I have my own collection of, font, of uh, clip art and I want to bring that in, it's easy enough to do. I'll select the drop down, and at the very bottom I have Add New. In here, I can click on Create Alias, and then browse to a folder where I have that content. Now that content can be on the local drive, or it can be on a network share. So I can have access to that clip art, and that can be shared out for other people that have uh, licenses for CorelDRAW that also want access to the clip art. Let me just close off the Connect Docker, and I might as well close off these other ones as well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Power Clip. Now, Power Clip gives me the ability to take an object or group of objects and put that inside a container. Now, this container can be a piece of text, it can be an object or a group of objects. I'm going to select this bitmap image, I'll right click and drag, and left the mouse button go and power clip inside. It's as easy as that. A lot of people will go to the objects menu and do power clip there. I find this quite a bit quicker. Now I want to center that properly. You'll notice I have a small menu up here. I can hit the drop down and I go center content. If I want to edit this, hold the control key down and click on the container itself. That will put me into the edit state and I can move this around. I can resize it or do whatever I want to with it. To finish editing, control click outside and that takes me out of the editing of the power clip image. Now in this scenario, I have an image and I do sublimation. I've got a customer that owns a restaurant and I want to pitch to him that we can take this image and make a mural on the back wall of the restaurant using ceramic tiles. In CorelDRAW, something like that is very easy to do. It takes me very little time, and to do a mural on ceramic tiles, I can probably earn a pretty penny on that. To do it in CorelDRAW, in my toolbox, underneath the Polygon tool, I have my Graph Paper tool. Now, this particular image is 4 by 6. So, with the Graph Paper tool selected, I want to change it to, I want to have 12 by 8. And now if I left click and drag, I'll create a grid over top of this. Tap my space bar. I'm now going to move this grid over here. Now, if I take this image, I can right click and drag, power clip inside, and then I want to center my contents. With the contents in here, I'll select the element. I'm going to use ungroup and it's now ungrouped the individual cells for that graph paper tool. I'll marquee select the top row, I'll move it straight up, and I'll take this element here and I'll move that straight over. Now if I marquee select this, I can do a shift E for evenly space, and I can do it for the subsequent rows as well. So if I was to move this up here, Align that with this object here, marquee select, and a shift E. You get the idea. So we break all this out. I th then go ahead and print this on my sublimating paper, sublimate the tiles, and then I can take it to the customer site and install it. And we have a beautiful mural in the back of his restaurant wall. All right, power trace. So power trace allows you to convert from a raster image to a vector image. I'm going to start with this one here, and if I go to the Trace Bitmap menu, 
I can also access this from the bitmap menu as well, but we have it on the interactive property bar. So much quicker to access from here. I'll click on the drop down, go to outline trace, and then I'll select clip art. This opens up my uh, power trace dialog box. I'm going to make that full screen. Now, for those that are doing, um, excuse me, for those that are doing vinyl cutting or screen printing, I want you to pay attention to this one item here. This is group by color, and this will become evident in a few seconds. So I'm going to select group by color. Then I can go to my colors tab. And in here, I can reduce the number of colors. So I'm going to hold the control key down and click on this and I'll merge these colors. I also have the ability in here to uh, edit the color. So if I wanted something other than blue, I can certainly do that. So I'm just simply reducing these colors down. If we're doing a screen, a screen print, we don't want to deal with too many colors in there. Seven colors is a bit much, uh, but I'll leave it like that for now. On the Adjustments tab, here I have the ability, uh, if it's a low-quality JPEG image, that I can remove the JPEG artifacting. I also have upsampling options available as well for illustration and photorealistic. I'm simply going to click OK to this. It's going to return me back to Corel Draw. Let me go ahead and select the background, and I, or the bitmap image rather, and I'll delete that. Now, if I select this element and I look in my Objects Docker, you can see I have a group of six objects. I'm going to ungroup this. Now I have ungroup and I have ungroup all. I'll simply ungroup it. With it ungrouped, you can see I have a group of seven objects. By selecting that, double clicking the outline fill, or sorry, the fill dialog down here. In here, I can select color palettes and I can go into my spot color. So very quick and very easy, we'll be able to take this image and convert it to spot colors so I can get ready for uh, making my screens. Once I've gone into the proper palette that I want to use, it will automatically match the closest color to it. I'll simply click OK, and now all of these items, all these blue items, are now the spot color blue. Of course, I do have the ability to change that. If I want to grab a specific Pantone color, then I can do that as well. Now, with this image, um, I've often been asked, how do I take a bitmap image and create a cut line around it? So I want to do a print cut solution. I need a cut line around this. An uh, easy way to do that is within Power Trace. I'm going to go to Outline Trace. Again, I'll select Clip Art. And here, what I'm going to do on the Colors tab, I'll reduce my number of colors right down. So I'm going to bring that down to about three or four colors. On the Settings tab, I want to make sure that I have uh, de uh, Delete Original Image not selected. I'll click OK to this. Now, with this vector group selected, I'm going to go to my Objects menu, down to Shaping, and then to Boundary. That's now created a hairline outline around the perimeter. If I hold my Alt key down, I do a single click. I've actually selected the group of elements. Of course, I could do this in the Object Docker. And it's simply a matter of hitting Delete. I now have a cut line around the perimeter of that bitmap that I can go ahead and send that out and then do the cutting. All right. Uh, Continuing with bitmaps, this is just a couple of little uh, watchouts or, or uh, things to, not to do within CorelDRAW or, or ways to, to overcome particular issues. So, for example, uh, we can crop a bitmap, and of course, you can use the shape tool to uh, marquee select these two nodes, hold the control key down, and I can move that in, and I can crop the, the image that way. The drawback that, with that is I haven't really changed the image at all. All I've done is I've created what we call a soft mask. Now, if I select my crop tool and marquee select, I can double click and it will crop that for me. If you do want to use this method here, you certainly can. Uh, for example, maybe I wanted to round one of the corners, then I can do that. If you're doing that, I strongly recommend that after you do that, go to the bitmap menu, convert to bitmap, set whatever resolution you want, and then click OK.
What that's going to do is it's going to get rid of that soft mask and make it the bitmap the way it is. Uh, resizing an image, very similar as well. This is actually a power clip, so if I control click, you can see that my image is actually rotated. When we have a rotated bitmap in Corel Draw and send that down to the printer, it's going to have to rotate those lines of, of a pixel sort of thing as it's ripping it. And that's going to increase the rip time at, uh, at when you're printing. To overcome that, bitmap menu, convert to bitmap, and then set your resolution in here. That's all there is to it. One other very, very common mistake is customers will import bitmap images, click and drag to size them the way they want them, put them on their screen. Maybe they're doing a, uh, a catalog of uh, sublimatable, sublimatable items that you create. So you've got 25 bitmap images on a page that you've imported, resized down, and then you go and print it and you wonder why it's taking so long to print. When you resize an image down in this manner by using the shaping handles, take a look at the resolution down below. You're not reducing the size of the bitmap itself, you're only reducing the visual footprint of it. So if you need to reduce a bitmap down like that, once you've done that, go to bitmap, convert to bitmap, and then simply click OK. That now has gotten rid of that extra weight on the bitmap, and it will increase, or sorry, it will reduce your file size tremendously. Uh, upsampling. Up until CorelDRAW 2021, we provided Ben Vista Photo Zoom, uh, which was an application that allowed you to upsample bitmaps. We've now brought the capabilities of upsampling into CorelDRAW 2021, and it's done a beautiful job. I'm going to select this bitmap here. It's 150 dpi, and you can see it's roughly 6 by 7 inches. If I go to my bitmap menu and down to resample, in here, I have the ability to uh, increase or decrease. If I select that I want to increase the size, and I'm going to do something crazy, I'm going to go 800%. Automatically, you'll see I now have these options down here. So I can do the upsampling illustration, photorealistic, or just leave it as is. For time, uh, photo, uh, photorealistic is going to take a bit of processing time. I'm just going to leave it as is just to show you that, keeping in mind that photorealistic will give you a much higher quality. So I'll simply click OK to this, and you can see very quickly it's upsampled that image. Now, I had two copies of this image on this page, so if I hold the Alt key down and I click right about here, it's going to dig down. It's going to select that bitmap below. I'm going to bring that to the front, and now I'm going to do an F4, and that zooms out to my entire page. This is my original image that was 150 dpi. This is the resized image at 800% larger. It's now 56 by 34 at 150 dpi. So it really does a beautiful job of upsampling. I'm going to select this and delete that, and we'll move on to the next page. All right, let's take a look at a couple of the uh, labs that we have within PhotoPaint. I'm going to select this image here. I'll right click and I'll select Edit Bitmap. Now, this is going to launch PhotoPaint for me. Now, I'll maximize the screen, and from the image menu, I'll go down to Cutout Lab. This gives me the ability to remove the background. So let's maximize this screen as well. First, I'm going to grab my highlighter. I'll zoom in a little bit more. And what I want to do is I want to draw 
a border around the element itself or the object that I want to cut out. Notice that I'm trying to keep half on, half off. I'm not being super critical or super careful, rather. That's not a problem at all. I can uh, fix that up uh, in a few moments. Let me just zoom out a little bit. And I'm going to come straight across here. And we'll go up this side as well. Now, I can change the brush size to make it finer or coarser. Uh, that basically allows me to go a little bit faster. I probably could have made this a little bit wider and uh, gone a little bit quicker, but that's fine. Once I've got the area marked off that I want to keep, I'm going to use the fill bucket and that will preserve the area that I want. Now, bottom left-hand corner, I'm going to click on preview. This allows me to preview my image. I can zoom in and I'm just gonna pan down a little bit. You'll notice some areas that I've taken out too much and other areas where I haven't taken out enough. This allows me to add back areas that I've taken out too much, and it's just a matter of brushing over this area. And sometimes it's a little difficult to see uh, with this um, uh, grid pattern in the background. So what I can do is under background, I have none. I can select grayscale. I can set matte black, or I can set white matte. And this allows me to better see what areas that I have to remove or what areas that I have to fill in. Now, for speed, or sorry, for time-wise, I'm not going to go around the entire image. I just want to show you basically how this is done. So it's just a matter of brushing out the areas that I don't want. And we'll come down here. And to brush in the areas that I do want, and I'm going to leave it like that. You get the idea. I'll simply click OK to this. That's going to return me into Photo Paint uh, with the background removed. I can click on Finish Editing or simply close out the application. I'll answer yes to this, and it's going to put me back into Corel Draw with this image cut out from the background. Now let's take a look at one more lab, and that's the Image Adjustment Lab. So I'll select this image, right-click, and select Edit Bitmap. And let's maximize photo paint. And now from the adjust menu, I'm going to image adjustment lab. And let's maximize this. Now in here, there's a number of different changes that I can make to this image. First off, I can change the temperature. Uh, so that's brought made a little bit warmer, brought the colors a little bit more natural. I also have the ability to increase saturation. We can modify brightness, contrast, highlights, shadows, and midtones, and basically bring up the image to get something that is uh, acceptable. Also within the image adjustment lab, bottom left-hand corner, you have this camera icon. By clicking on that, it's going to create a snapshot. So I can go through, I can make some additional changes. Maybe I want to bring up the contrast a little bit. And let's play with the shadows. I'll create another snapshot. Try bringing this down quite a bit and see what happens there. That's a little bit too dark. And so we can play around with this.
I could have tried the auto adjust to see if that the, where, how that is. This allows me the ability to set my white point and my black point. And so once I've gone through and I've gotten an image that I like the, the uh, coloring to, I'll simply select it. You'll note the blue bar at the top. And when I click OK, that's the image that I'm going to be bringing it back into Photo Paint. So let me just close this down again. That's going to return me to Corel Draw with the image updated. Um, this is a little effect I like to show, uh, creating a distressed effect. Now, this could be done with uh, a raster image. Uh, I find that rusted metal, uh, this is an old piece of weathered wood, uh, maybe a, a photograph of, of ripples on, a, on a, uh, a swimming pool, stuff like that work quite well. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'll start off by resizing this image to completely cover my artwork. Now, from the bitmap menu, I'm going to go down to Mode, and I want to select Grayscale. Next, I'm going to go to my Effects menu, down to Adjust, and I want to bring up my Tone Curve. Now, in the Tone Curve, what I want to do is I want to reduce the amount of white in the image and intensify the blacks. something like that. And I'll click OK to this. All right, now that we've got this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my bitmap menu, down to mode once again, and I'm going to select black and white. Now, with black and white, I want to make sure I'm using line art. And here I can set the threshold to make it more or less uh, noticeable. I'll leave it like that and click OK. Now, one thing about a black and white image, image is that it's a one-bit image. That bit can either be on or off. What I can do is I can change my fill to white and my outline to nothing. And what that's done is it's basically given me the white area, so this allows me to create a distressed look. All right, the next one I want to show is non-destructive effects. So. Uh, new to QuailDraw 2019, we've added the ability to create non-destructive effects. These effects can be applied to both bitmaps as well as vector. So I'm actually applying uh, bitmap effects to a vector object. So if I go to my effects menu, I'm going to go down to Art Strokes, and I'll select Impressionist. Let it process that. I'll click OK. Now if I go back up to the effects menu, I want to go to Creative, and then to Fabric. We'll apply the Quilt effect, and finally, back up to the Effects menu, down to Blur, and I'm going to add a Gaussian Blur to this. And I'll accept the, uh, the defaults that I have here, and click OK. Now, if I right-click on this, you'll see that I have object properties selected. So that tells me I have the object properties Docker already opened up. On the right hand side, I'm going to click on properties. And in here, when I select this element, I now have an effects tab. I'll click on my effects tab and you can see that I've applied a Gaussian blur, fabric and impressionist. In here, I have the ability to turn that vision on or off. I also have the ability to edit it directly in here, and I can add another effect if I wanted to. I also have the ability to delete the effect or change the order of the effect. So we've been able to add effects to this element without actually causing any distortion or any um, degradation of the original element. Now, one more thing about this that makes it very useful is if I right-click on this, and I go down to Object Styles, New Style From, Bitmap Effect, and I'm just going to call this uh, Test. And I'll click OK. I've got Open Object Style Docker selected, so when I click OK, it will open up the Object Styles Docker with this style in it that I can then make use of. So I have my style that I've created. I can select this element, Click Apply to Selected, and this will apply that same style to this. I have a piece of text over here. I can apply it to this object as well. It's simply a matter of selecting the text and simply click Apply to Selected.
Now, if I wanted to, I can come back in here. I can select this uh, effect. I don't want that. I simply hit the delete key and it will delete the effect from all of the uh, objects that I have on screen. All right, let me close off the Styles Docker and we'll go on to our next page. So art styles, uh, art styles are a lot of fun to play with. If I go to my effects menu, down to creative, and in here I have art style. Now, there's a number of different art styles that we have available to us. Uh, first one is smooth acrylic. These uh, effects are fairly intensive and uh, there is uh, a control within tools options that I can have it use uh, GPU processing as well to uh, improve the speed of that. Um, so this is the acrylic style. I'm going to grab uh, neon, for example, and I'll make that medium. And here we have that effect. So it's a lot of fun to play with this. I'm going to hit cancel on this. Let me go on to the next slide. Now, in here we have uh, scripts and macros. I'm just going to show you one macro, uh, and that is the color swatch. So you have a, uh, you're doing sublimation or screen printing. You've approached a, a school uh, phys ed class. They want track suits made, and they also want, um, uh, sorry, track suits printed on, and they want their gym bags uh, to have a logo on them as well. So you want to be able to match the school colors. So what colors are you going to use? If we go to the Windows menu, down to uh, color palettes, and I'm going to click on palettes. Now, in here, I'm going to go to spot palette. I'll click on Pantone, and then I'm going to go into previous version, and I want to select the first one, which is the Corel 8 Pantone palette. This is the Pantone palette that has the Pantone white in it. Now, this particular script will only work with color palettes that are currently open. So if I was to open a couple of other color palettes, and here's the pastel color palette, now I'm going to launch the script. So if I go to my tools menu, down to scripts, and then run. In here, under macros in, I want to select Color Chart Creator, and I'll click Run once again. In this dialog box, when I hit the drop down, you'll see I have a number of palettes in here. These are the palettes that I've just opened up, as well as my document palette across the bottom. So I want to select this palette here. I can add a date, printer information. I can also set the spacing. I'm going to bring that spacing down to two. I can put an outline around uh, each color. I don't want to do that. And I'll simply click OK. And as you can see, it's created the document for me. I'll go back to the beginning of the document. And now I have the ability to go through this document. Let me just go to my uh, Windows menu down to Dockers, and I'm going to select Pages. In here, I'm going to select Multi-Page, and I'll just zoom out. And you can see that we have a number of pages in here with my color palette on that. So very quick and very easy. I can print out whichever sheet that I want to, and then, and then go from there. All right, let's go back out to a single page. I'm going to close off the uh, Palettes Docker. I'll close off my Pages Docker. And uh, let's just close out this file completely. All right, Pointalizer. So this is an, uh, used to be called an extension that we shipped with CorelDRAW X8. Uh, and it's a great way to create a, a pseudo halftone type pattern uh, within a document. So with the file selected, I'm going to go to my effects menu and down to Pointalizer. And in here, I'll just leave the defaults as they are. I'll simply click Apply. Very quickly, it's gone through, and it's created a halftone pattern using 16 colors. Let me do a Control-Z to undo that. I'll deselect Color Limit, and I'll click Apply once again. So it's going to go through the file, and it's going to create that image with the uh, multiple colors. I'm going to delete this, and I want to show you one more with this uh, process. So I'm going to select this clipart image. 
under shape, you can see I have circle. I also have custom. I'm going to select custom. I'll click on select and I'll click on this. It's just a piece of text I created with the letter X and I'll apply. So I've taken this clip art image and I've now created a cross stitch pattern. So if you wanted to sublimate something like that onto a, uh, a cotton towel or something like that, then you can certainly do that. I'm just going to do an F4 to zoom back out to my page and let's go on to the next. Okay, I'm going to close off this docker. And I also want to close out these color palettes. So I'll go to my Windows menu, down to Color Palettes, and then to Palettes. Now, I could drag these off and uh, close them out one at a time. I can also come in here, and I will simply deselect the palettes that are in here. And that will effectively turn them all off. Okay, I'll close out the palettes docker. So from time to time, you'll want to create a custom color palette based on a document or a selection. I'm going to select this element, and then from the Windows menu, I'll go down to Color Palettes, and then Create Palette from Selection. So very quickly, it's brought the dialog box. I'm just going to call this Flower and I'll click on save. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a custom color palette for me and it's docked over here. And this is based on the colors that are in this particular file. So if I bring those out, you can see we have that. All right, let's go to the next page. And we're actually at the uh, end of this almost. Workspace customization, I've saved the best for last. This is, uh, is in my opinion, is my favorite tool uh, within the entire application, the ability to customize. You've seen that I've been uh, moving forward and backwards on the pages without really doing much of anything. I've uh, customized some keyboard shortcuts for that. To customize a keyboard shortcut, we go to the Tools menu, to Options, and then Customization. Now in here, I want to select commands. And once I customized are in the layout menu. And what I did is I changed the next and previous page. So next page, shortcut key, I'm using the number two. And previous page, I use the number one. My thought is this. I've got my right hand in the mouse. I've got my left hand on the keyboard. If I want to do page up, page down, to go forward and backward, I have to take my hand off the mouse and use my keyboard. That takes time. With my left hand on the keyboard, I tap the one or tap the two, it takes me forward and it takes me back. Other keyboard shortcuts I use are in the view menu, and I go to wireframe, and my keyboard shortcut for wireframe is the letter W, and I assign. To get out of wireframe, I go to Enhanced View, and the one I use for that is the letter Q. An easy way to remember that is that I want to quit wireframe. A nice thing about it is they're side by side on the keyboard, so I can very quickly toggle back and forth. I'll click Assign for this. Let me just double check my wireframe to make sure I did click Assign on that. I did. That's good. Next ones I'm going to do is under the Objects menu. And I'm going to go down to Group. And if I have a problem finding it here, I have the ability to search. I can also go to the Objects menu here, down to Group, and then select Group. And so it's automatically found that for me. Currently, it's Control G. I'm going to delete that, and I'm going to use the letter G. Uh, from time to time, I have arthritis in my hand and it acts up. It's difficult to do a finger stretch uh, to control U or control G. So just use a single keyboard shortcut. And I can do that with my left hand uh, tapping those keys. So I've assigned that. And then, of course, I want to do an ungroup. And the keyboard shortcut I assigned for that is the letter U and I click Assign.
So very easy to uh, assign keyboard shortcuts. I'm going to click OK to this. Now, one more thing about customization is you'll find that around the screen we have these icons here. I've got another one over here, and I have uh, one for my dockers as well. Over here, for example, when I click on this, I have the ability to turning on and off features. You'll notice that by default, we don't have the outline pen uh, on, the, um, on the bar, so I can actually click on this, and it will add the outline pen for me. If I want to create a custom keyboard shortcut, that's very easy to do. Some of the commands I use a lot is contour, so I'll click and hold. I'm going to hold the Control plus Alt key down. I'll left-click Contour, and I'll bring this out onto the screen. I've now started to build my own toolbar. Back under the tools here, I want the Envelope tool. Click and drag, and I'll drop that right there. Next is from the Text menu, and I want Fit Text to Path. So Control plus Alt, left-click and drag, and I can drop that right on there. And the final one I use a lot is Convert to Bitmap. So again, Control plus Alt, click and drag, and I'm going to bring this right out here. So I've now effectively created a toolbar that I can dock wherever I want on the system. And it's a great way to save time and really speed up productivity within the application. Once we've done that, from the Tools menu to Options to Workspace, in here, what I want to do is I want to export the workspace, and that's going to export with my keyboard shortcuts, my layouts, and everything else. So if I'm in a design shop, maybe there's three designers, we all want to use the same workspace for, for efficiency, then I can export my workspace and share that. Uh, you also, if you have a previous version of CorelDRAW, from CorelDRAW X7 and forward, we're able to bring in uh, previous workspaces. So if you're upgrading from CorelDRAW 2020 to 2021, then of course you can save your workspace and bring it in. And it's simply a matter of clicking on import to import the previous workspace. Now, the final thing I want to talk about, and I briefly mentioned this at the beginning, is learn.corel.com. This is our discovery center, and it's here where you can access all sorts of items, things such as uh, tutorials. So there's tutorials for graphics, for Paint Shop Pro, Video Studio, that sort of thing. You also find uh, a Q&A series. This is a Q&A series for Corel Draw as well as um, a Paint Shop Pro. So when we get customers uh, sending us questions or common questions that come in through the support line, we have videos on here that will take you through the Q&A of that. Uh, you'll find a link for free stuff. We have uh, regular contests in here that you can enter with your artwork, uh, support as well as community. So it's a great place to, to visit. It's easy URL to remember. It's learn.corel.com. And that brings us to the end of this session. I do want to thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, what I've presented. I hope you've learned uh, uh, some tips that you can take away with and become a lot more productive and a lot more prosperous. Thank you very much, and have a great day.